This video was brought to you by us, Slightbean. We are storytellers and designers, and we can help you make a pitch deck that rocks. Find out more at slightbean.com slash pitch deck. A younger version of me and a younger version of this YouTube channel started this series called Startup Funding Explained. We went through a theoretical company's story while analyzing how the cap table evolved through various rounds of funding. Make sure to watch parts one through three if you wanna get a grip on how all that stuff works. And then we left part four unfinished. And if you're only here for the good stuff, that's okay. This video will analyze a few exit scenarios for that theoretical company and how much money everybody makes or doesn't make. By the way, a lot of the topics covered here were way beyond my expertise. So Steve Barsh, who you've seen as a guest in this channel, help us put these estimations together. Make sure to check out his video on startup exits and his channel on Dreamit. Let's look at the last version of the cap table we left on episode three. In a nutshell, here's where the company is at. They raised a seed round of funding through a convertible note. They raised a series A round of funding, which valued the company at $10 million. The investors on the series A negotiated a liquidation preference that guarantees them two times the capital invested. A traditional series A round probably had a bunch of additional terms, but we are trying to keep this simple for YouTube purposes, so we'll stick with that. We also had two option pools. The first one with a strike price per share of 0.03125 dollars, and the second one with a strike price per share of one dollar. If some of this stuff doesn't make sense, again, make sure you watch the third episode in this series to get a grip on how these stock option pools worked. Now, we will go over two scenarios in this video a rescue acquisition or aqua hire and a strategic exit for the company. In a video from a couple of weeks ago, Steve went over what each of these acquisitions meant. Make sure you watch that video for more context. And now let's get into the numbers. Scenario one, an aqua hire. Let's say that this company started struggling soon after that Series A round. It has managed to stay afloat, but it's not growing very much. So the company might seek out a buyer that has an interest in taking profits out of the business. There are plenty of holding companies or funds that, and what they do is they purchase SaaS companies and they are very good at monetizing them. A SaaS company usually operates on a 70 to 85% gross margin. That's revenue versus the cost of the servers. Their remaining costs for the company are the support staff, the technical and product team for, you know, for new features and maintenance, the operational costs, the office accounting, the marketing stuff. So these holding companies, what they do is they acquire multiple SaaS companies, small-ish SaaS companies, and they have a centralized shared operation. They have centralized accounting, legal, developers, and support. So these resources are shared across all those SaaS companies in the holding to squeeze a lot more profit than the company can do if it just operates independently. So they are not buying the business for strategic reasons. They don't care about the customers or what they can do with the technology. They're buying it because they can see that it can generate a profit for them. So the acquisition price is probably going to be a 1x to 2x multiple of their revenue. Another common scenario is for a company to absorb the team and perhaps a patent or a brand name. In those cases, some price references are, for example, a million dollars per engineer, or merely enough to give investors a 1x return on their investment so they can green light the deal. So if you think the $1 million per engineer sounds like a lot, it may not be. If the average base salary in New York City or Silicon Valley is 130,000 per engineer, plus benefits, and you could hire a team of five or six engineers who have worked together for years and are highly efficient as a team, the price is maybe not that crazy. In particular, if this is an aqua hire at a very low purchase price, the engineers, employees, stock options may be worthless if they're underwater. Underwater means the startup's price per share at acquisition is below the stock option strike price for the options the engineers have. So the stock options are worthless and the acquirer is giving an incentive for the engineers to stay on. Note that that million dollars per engineer may involve a retention component to make sure the engineers don't just get the million dollars at closing and then they just walk out the door. Again, none of these options or reasons for an acquisition is very exciting, but they can provide what we call a soft landing for the team and some liquidity for the investors. There can be an inherent tension here. Sometimes the founders are more interested in retention bonuses for the team, including themselves, while on the other hand, investors are more interested in cash for the stock. Often, there is a lot of negotiation that takes place around these points. Long story short, let's say that our theoretical business with a 12.5 post money valuation after the last round 
gets an offer to be acquired for $12 million. So the first thing that we will get with that is a price per share. Remember that we had 11,777,778 shares. So a $12 million offer means that we have $1.019 per share. However, we have to start with the liquidation preferences. Remember, Series A investors need to get a 2x multiplier on their original investment and convertible note investors too, because remember that the convertible note investors piggyback on the same terms as the Series A. So out of that $12 million, we will have to take $5 million to pay those Series A investors two times their $2.5 million investment and $1 million for the convertible note investors to pay twice their original 500K investment. And that's $6 million that effectively bought out the preferred shares. That means that those investors are paid up and that leaves us with $6 million for the rest of the shares, which in this case are the common shares. That's $6 million divided by 8.5 million shares for an effective price per share of 70 cents and some. But we are not done yet. We have to do a small parenthesis to talk about these stock options. Stock options are options to buy shares at a specific strike price. They're designed that way for two reasons. One, so that when they are issued, the person who receives them doesn't have any tax implications. Since they're not receiving the actual shares, they don't have to pay taxes for them. And number two, so that the employee receiving them is motivated to increasing the value of the company. If the company's price per share doesn't grow after they receive those stock options, then the stock options aren't really worth anything. Because again, the price per share didn't change. So let's say that an employee has 1,000 stock options at a strike price of $1. If the company gets acquired for $2 per share, they can effectively execute their stock options. That's technically buying the shares at their unique special discounted strike price and then sell them for double that price to the company that's making the acquisition. So 1,000 stock options bought for $1 each and then sold for $2 each. That's a net earning of $1,000. That's great. Employee stock options have a lot of moving parts. When structuring stock option plans, you have to make sure that you have accountants and lawyers working with you who have a ton of experience with them. If your aunt or uncle is an attorney and largely handles divorce or personal injury cases and says, hey, I'm happy to help you, you should say no thanks. If this is not done perfectly, a poorly structured stock option plan can have devastating consequences for everyone. From vesting schedules to cliffs, to how long to exercise after separation and how long until options expire. Expiring options can be a big issue for companies that stay private for a long time, like Uber and Airbnb, where employee stock options may expire if it takes too long for the company to get acquired or go public. If the stock options are going to expire, employees have to actually come out of pocket and put money down, money that they maybe don't even have, uh, to actually exercise and buy out the stock option so that they can get the actual stock before the stock option expires. Again, like Steve said, in this video on acquisitions, you need to bring your A team. Now, looking at our scenario, you will see the problem. The second stock option pool this company offered has a strike price of $1. And the price per share on this acquisition after paying that liquidation preference is 70 cents. It's not worth buying shares to then resell them for less. So we can assume that the second stock option doesn't get executed. It's worth nothing. That means that the company only has 8 million shares to sell. At 8 million shares, we have a slightly higher strike price of 75 cents per share. And that is the price that we'll be using. All right, so Founder One sells 4 million shares at 75 cents, effectively getting $3 million. Founder Two gets 1.1 and some million dollars for the shares that they had vested so far. Family and friends investors get $1.5 million, which is a significant 30X multiplier on their investment. That is not bad at all. The employees that hold stock option pools have to buy their share, so they have 500,000 shares total, which they purchased at the original first option pool strike price of $0.023, so they have to pay $11,000 for them. Again, this is all done simultaneously because they are selling them now for 75 cents each, which gives them earnings of 72 cents or $0.727 per share. Since each of the two imaginary employees had 250,000 shares, they are getting profits of $181,000, which is not bad at all. Or is it? Well, it depends because if they had been working at this startup for several years and they had taken a below market salary in hopes of getting reach from those stock options, and they spend that, they spend working for the company for three years, and then they get $180,000 in taxable cash, that's $60,000 per year, which is 
not that much really, considering three years and again, a below market salary. Now, all that money is subject to taxes. So be prepared to take a chunk out of it. If you're a foreign founder, not registered as a US taxpayer, that tax is actually gonna be a flat 30%. And then that is that for scenario one. Let's look at a slightly better scenario two. Let's say that the company gets acquired for $35 million. In this case, the price per share would be a very sweet $2.97 per share. In this case, the liquidation preference clause doesn't apply since the price per share guarantees that the investors are getting at least that 2X return that they have negotiated. So the math for this round is a lot easier. The number of shares owned by each shareholder multiplied by $2.97. And here's how that would look like. Now, interestingly enough, a $35 million acquisition sounds like an amazing deal for the founders. The founder who stuck around, the, I'm assuming the CEO, is getting an $11 million exit, which is certainly a life-changing amount of money. Even the second option pool of employees is getting gains of $1.97 per share, so they will need to virtually pay $500,000 to buy those shares, but they will get almost $1.5 million in exchange for them. Remember, this is a cashless transaction, so the option pool holders don't actually have to buy the stock. They just receive the difference on the price. And then you'd think the investors did great, but maybe not so much. They're getting a 3X return on their investment, which is good, but certainly not what a venture capital investor signed up for. The success rate of tech companies and tech startups is pretty low, so investors are looking for a big whale, that big 10X return that makes up for all the companies in their batch that didn't work out. This company is making up for three of those companies, so it is good news, but it's not amazing news. This directly connects to a common question we get from founders around business valuation and even around the type of company that can afford or that can position itself to raise venture capital. You know, by many measures, this is a pretty successful theoretical company. It's getting acquired for $35 million, but it's still a meh story for the investors. If you intend to raise venture capital, you need to have a clear path to that $100 million or more valuation. And now, hopefully, you understand why. So we can't turn a $1 million company into a $100 million company. But what we can do is make sure that your pitch deck tells the best possible story about your business, either by having our team help you write it or by having our team help you design it, or if you use our self-service AI design tool. So check out slidebean.com slash pitch deck to learn how we can help you with your deck. Hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next week.